outside of its traditional doctrinal and theological focus. For me, the first set of issues that I would like to talk about the first set of issues relates to authority and leadership in the community called church. Now, speaking of a demographic shift, I believe that depending on how we understand it, we face the temptation of being held captive by a fascination and a charm of numbers. I believe that ecclesiology is not a function of numerical or demographic weight. That the church in Africa is growing in importance should not be reduced to a matter of the population of African Christians. And I think that one part of the church needn't be accorded greater significance simply on account of the fact that it has more members than the others. Whether the church is a persecuted minority in Siberia or Somalia should matter less in terms of its importance in the universal Christian community. The Apostle Paul has an approach that I believe may help us to develop a more theologically balanced attitude toward the notion of a demographic shift. In several instances, Paul speaks of mutuality, interdependence, and solidarity. I have a lot of things against Paul, but I think he was right on this one. For him, the body of Christ is composed of many parts. And each part comes with a particular gift, a particular charism. The combination of these gifts helps to build up and sustain the community called church. I strongly believe that these same values of mutuality, interdependence, solidarity should inform our conversation about this demographic shift. One part of the church, let's say the global south, should not be rejoicing over being spared the misfortune of diminishment in numbers that is the lot of another part of the church, say the global north. Nor should one part think that it is now our turn to rule the church on account of the size of the membership of our Christian community. I believe many of us will still recall that in 2005, in the aftermath of the death of Pope John Paul II, before the election of Pope Benedict XVI, there was much media hype and speculation about the possibility of actually having an African Pope. And there were names put forward. Well, that would have been quite sensational an exception. The question is, why? Why? The church prides itself in being one, holy, catholic, and apostolic. It is the oldest globalized institution on earth. Its reach is universal and global. As such, the rise to prominence of Christian leaders from the global south, I believe, ought to be a matter of course. There are competent, inspirational, saintly religious leaders in the global south, too. So that their claim to leadership roles in the global church should not be considered as a kind of a reward or a function of the size of their demographic constituents. Ecclesial leadership should not be about a proportional representation, but rather about what gift each part of the Christian community brings for the building up, the edification of the whole. 
speaking of gifts, let me share with you about one of the gifts that I believe that the Christian community on the continent can offer the world church in terms of the exercise of leadership. I mentioned last week that African theologians speak very freely about a phenomenon called, or a reality called, Palava. Palava was once described, I only know the definition in French because I think it's very interesting, as an uh, end school in your deal for two then chef Africa. Means a useless conversation by people seated around an African, at an African chief. That's how it was once described. But it roughly translates as dialogue, participatory discourse, consensus building, open ended conversation. Open ended conversation. <clears throat> it describes a style of leadership and social interaction that allows every member of the community an active voice in determining and examining the viability of particular tra traditions in the community. Ordinarily, in the context of palavra, norms and values will not be the subject of categorical impositions foisted on the community by the leader. Essentially, African Palava claims to be inclusive, giving voice to everyone, including the invisible community of ancestors and the living dead. It is a voice in the formulation of norms and judgments that regulates life and practices in the Christian community. I believe that as a global church, we can benefit from the value of Palavra as a model of leadership. And I see this as a gift that the African community can contribute to the universal church. Because it is not a top-down style of leadership. It is, in fact, the antithesis of centralization and concentration of power and authority in the hands of a few who sit at the top of the hierarchical ladder. If the tenets of this model of leadership are practiced within the universal church, we will then need to rethink how, for example, we deal with dissenting voices within our Christian community. And we should also expect to see a community that is more inclusive, tolerant, open to dialogue, listening, practicing mutual respect, and fully committed to the principles of subsidiarity and active participation of all, but especially one that can integrate a multiplicity of narratives. So this is something I would like to put forward as one of the challenges coming from one of the new centers of gravity of Christianity. There's a second set of challenges stemming from this demographic shift. And it relates to the issue of immigration and the migration of religious beliefs, values, and practices. Today, one of the global challenges that we face is the mass of people on the move. People are moving from everywhere to everywhere. Recent United Nations estimates suggest that more than 200 million persons live, seek, and find refuge and work in a country different from the one in which they were born. 